Hey there. So uh, we had a that was that was that was fun. And did you all cry? <laughs> it was very powerful. <laughs> I, I've seen this now a million times, you know, through the edit and the editing process, and it still just conjures up so many emotions in me, um, just like the book did. And so um, it's, I'm just so happy to talk to the two of you all because this is the core of, the, of how we got here. So I, we'll start with, with you, Amara. How did we get here? So it actually was really interesting. And, you know, I mean, it's the power of relationships and it's the power of just thinking creatively about how you want to portray a message. So, you know, transparently, you know, obviously you and I had worked together through different AHF and Black projects. George has been an instrumental part of some of the work that Black has done, particularly focused on gay Black men. And when he talked about the book, he and I were having a conversation and I said, you know, what if we did a, you know, kind of a recorded broadcast of your book for National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day? And he was like, I really love that idea. Let's let's talk more about it. So we talked more about it. And um, one thing I pride myself on is not knowing how to do things, but knowing the right people to call to make it happen. And then, of course, Nathan, it was a no brainer to, you know, to call you and thank God you were free and available thinking you were gonna have a little vacation um, because you really were the right mastermind to collaborate with George um, to make the magic happen that we just experienced. So, you know, I, it, it's the power of a simple idea, talking it through with people who have a trusting relationship with each other. And, you know, and here we are. So thank you both, first of all. Thank you, truly thank you both. Thank you. And I, I just want to I just want to add to that, you know, how divinely inspired it was. I had just finished reading uh the book and you had no idea, Mara. And I was going to call George or figure out how I could get in touch with them. And and you know, I knew I was like, I know somebody that knows them. And yeah. Because I have to just say how much, you know, so so much of this book resonated with me. And then almost like clockwork, you got you, you both called me on uh, and uh asked me to do this. And it was really literally, I was exhausted. I had not, you know, 2020 had worn me out just like so many of us, but I could not say no. And I just have to say, uh, George, what a brilliant um person you are, what a brilliant writer you are. And then to have been able to work with you these last couple of months, you're also just a joy, uh, which is like unheard of, the brilliant genius joy. Uh, all at once. Tell us how you feel about your words coming to life in this form. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Um, you know, I, I think I have a great imagination, but um, I think there are times where even my imagination, I guess at times has its limits. Like I knew what I saw for my words and I knew what I wanted to see for the book. Uh, but it was awesome to hear Amara's thoughts on this really, really cool project. And then to see your vision come to life really um, from, you know, just what you imagined and, and who you imagined being part of it and people who I imagine being part of it. Uh, I think the really great thing about it is I come from community and I'm still very heavily involved in black queer community. And so knowing that we, you know, my book came out during a pandemic, knowing that our communities are the most affected when any type of health crisis happens and knowing that many of the people in our community may not even be able to afford the book, uh, afford an ebook or an audio book or um, afford, have any access to it for us to be able to create something with the book that can go to community that is free of cost uh, so that people can also uh, learn from, from the story that I wrote and uh, be healed by it and also uh, work through some of the things that they need to work through uh, with using me as the vessel. I think that's the most amazing part about it is uh, how we've still found another way to create something magical for Black community uh, and be, to be able to give it to community, uh, you know, free of charge with, you know, during these times, I think that's the most beautiful thing about it is finding ways to still get the message out there uh, in the midst of chaos and in the midst of obstacles. And, you know, Nathan, if I can just tap into something that, that you said and then, then what George says, um, it really, it was divinely ordained. I mean, because it really wasn't, it was not like, I mean, it started off as like, 
not even a structured conversation that George and I are having. I mean, we were talking about some other things and then that came up. And then um, I was talking to a colleague, Lauren, about, you know, trying to figure this out. Not, I mean, because in my mind, honestly, I, I think about you as this, as this filmmaker, you know, this magical filmmaker. So I it never thought to me of initially, like, would Nathan do this? But it just, in my spirit, it felt so right. And then you said yes, but even the process of how the um, actors were identified. You know, it was like every step of the way when we, all three of us kind of got, got ourselves out of the way and let kind of the spirit guide it like it was guiding it. Every single step of the way, I, you know, it, we see that it was all the right cast to be a part of it. You know, you two as the creative elements to be a part of it. You know the the magic of even the idea because if y'all remember we were we were all fixated on it was going to be filmed here in Atlanta. Yeah. And, you know things started and they were like well maybe it should be in New York and then it just was kind of like it, I mean so every step of the way and and George I think it goes to your point because the intention was to give back to community and to empower community and to uplift community but I really do believe that all three of us um, confirm that we felt very divinely guided through the whole process. And so it's been just so magical. And I think that is why what we just experienced was so magical. I mean, I, I will tell you, honestly, when George and I are talking about it, I had no idea what this would look like. You know what I mean? And this is like beyond everything um, of the intertwining of these beautiful pictures of your life, George. And, you know, I mean, it just, it's so beautiful. It's so, I, I can't, I can't even say, I could watch it another million times, Nate. Well, I, I, that's a testament to uh, you, Amara, having the vision. And then also Black and AHF consistently supporting us in the community that are creators. Uh, I know that you've supported both George and I on other projects. And so what you guys, what you all continue to do is just really beneficial. Um, and I think it is connected. Um, I, one of the things I have to say talking about the pictures, the MVP for me is Nanny. That uh, I, <laughs> Nanny is the MVP. The, just my favorite moment is the image of Nanny in the red. And she's sitting there because she knows that she she felt she was done. And I, was like, and I love that moment. Um, talk about, you know, why representation matters to you, Georgia. Why you had to, you always, we've, you've quoted uh, Tony, uh, is it Tony Morrison? Yeah. Uh, several times. Talk about that and why you have to write the book. Yeah, Toni Morrison's quote uh, is, is, if there's a book that you want to read and hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And I just take that into everything that I do in life. Um, I think representation and visibility, it's the starting point for us. I always say it's not like where we end. I think a lot of times uh, society makes it our like ending point to almost be like, look, you, you finally made it. And realistically, it's like, well, no, this is where our journey actually has to begin, because now that you can see one of us, it is literally just the representation of a million of us. And so we now have to do the work to allow everybody else uh, to come in. And I think in black storytelling, it, it takes a lot of care and a lot of patience. Uh, I think people are often, you know, they often see black characters as the villains. And we, you know, we hear the stories of the trauma, but we don't hear like the totality of the story. And so even in writing the book, uh, I wanted to make sure that I was, making the characters who are real people in my life uh, total and making them whole and letting everybody else know that it's okay to, you know, that we're, we're equal part, not equal parts, but we're made up of the good parts and the bad parts. So we're not just the total sum of our bad parts, that we are the total sum of all of our parts. Um, and, you know, in regards to my grandmother, I just felt it was so important because we all have those quote leaders, as I like to say, you know, the Baldwins, the Audre Lords, uh, Martin Luther Kings, who we pull quotes from on a macro level. But on a micro level, I think in each of our families, we always have that one person that we go to for the advice, that one person that gives us the message, that gives us the word. And for my family, it was uh, my grandmother, Nanny. And it's always so interesting that that red picture is everybody's favorite because the hat she's wearing is the last one I bought her for Christmas. Mm. Um, she got sick. So, you know, that picture, I think, is just really, really special for all of us because she specifically got that suit to go with the hat I got her. Um, and you can tell she just knew that it was like perfect. Like, and she just looked so perfect in that picture. And I think that's 
for me, like the memory that I want everybody to take away is like, you know, this woman from the South who just kind of gave her all. And we all have that person in our lives who, you know, just just does that for black folks and community. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just think like she's representative of all of the the big mamas and the nannies and the Medeas and and you know, all of the characters that we have seen, you know, the iterations of, of, of black grandmothers we have seen. She just embodied all of them. And, um, you know, and I think that's why Jennifer was able to never have met my grandmother and nail her perfect. Uh, because it just came through on the pages and, and she just brought br life into, into it. Amara, speaking of representation, why was it important to you? Because this is National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day, right? So it's the entire Black community uh, that's targeted or, or, or spoken to on this day. Why did you think this particular story was important to represent on this day? Well, you know, it's interesting thing because I think it really has so much to do with just conversations that George and I and you and I separately had um, around the bigger picture. Uh, and the bigger picture is, and I love it when you came up with the kind of the tagline, stigma got to go, because we know, you know, on so many levels, you know, whether it's looking at gender identity, whether it's looking at racial identity, whether it's looking at social economic class, what have you across the board, stigma disproportionately impacts us on so many levels. And I'm not even talking, I, mean, I just wanna stay within the lens of the black community as George was talking about. I oftentimes say, you know, I have grew up around a lot of white folks um, in my journey. And I said, you know, white folks don't really spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to separate out or disproportionalize the black community. It's almost like there's a drop in there and we'll do it to ourselves. And so I felt like it was important that we needed to have you know, we can talk about HIV and AIDS, but if we don't talk about the impact of stigma within our community, then, you know, it's almost like we're allowing community to be in a space of separation as opposed to the unity that is the heart of the word community. Um, and knowing George's, I hadn't even read the book at that point, but just knowing who George was and the conversations that we had, it was almost like intuitively, I was like, we need to incorporate these two um, and one, because I thought it was also really important in a different kind of a way, in a different space for his voice to be heard. You know, because I mean, there's there some really, and I think we saw in the chapters that were chosen, some real beauty in the consistent messaging around not being so caught up in terms of who you are and who we are as opposed to whose we are. You know, and I think, you know, Nanny was kind of the epicenter of really the queen mother, if you will, of truly building community in a loving way and in a very unconditional way. So I, it reminds me of other folks in that role of like, like you can bring all of who you are to the table. Um, and as long as this is all brought in the spirit of love, you're going to be given and embraced in the spirit of love. And that's the essence of the black family. And we got to go back to that. And this book was just the perfect example to have that conversation around how some some ways we've gotten far removed from the essence of love and humanity within the black community. I think that you that is that is spot on and that's one of the things that you do so brilliantly in the the book and I might overuse that word today uh George because that's how I feel after being on this journey with you all for uh, the last few months uh is you talk about and I think that's why I resonated the text and the work resonated so much with me is because you talk a great deal about the intersectionality of your blackness and your black queerness and the dilemma of reconciling those two. And then we talk about stigma. And I, I firmly believe that stigma stems from, you know, HIV and AIDS being a gay man's disease when it was first introduced to the world. And in the black community, we have yet to get rid of that, right? And so it prevents us, it prevents layers and layers and layers of things from us moving forward where we see other communities and their rates, infection rates going down, ours continue to go up because of that stigma, because we're not reconciling around black queerness and the black community. I want you to talk a little bit about that and, and how you have moved from that. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, HIV is another part of my intersection because I'm HIV positive. And so being one of the most vocal, 
probably now at this point, uh, black people <laughs> who is HIV positive with a platform my size that's, that that actually says that I am, uh, that that becomes a, another part of the story and another part of the journey because this book, it was written by me, somebody who is living with HIV. And so it's interesting because the traumas in the book, people often ask me like, well, why didn't you really write about HIV in the book? I said, I didn't uh, acquire HIV while between those ages. I said, but what's interesting is the things that I went through are set me up for the risk of it. And so in reading that, the vulnerability just kept growing as you get through the book, as I was learning consent and I was learning these things that had been almost taken from me because, you know, black queer people, we don't really get to live a full adolescence. And then we don't have the resources around sexual sexuality, sexual identity. And so when we do finally start to come into our own, we are already being thrown into uh, the, the vulnerable category of uh, HIV and the epidemic. And so, yeah, I mean, for me, in order to get to this place now, it was truly recognizing all of the things that make me who I am, my blackness, my queerness, the fact that I am HIV positive, uh, but that none of those things, like I said, they don't reduce me. And, you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing now is to reduce stigma, uh, living boldly as the person that I am and allowing others to be able to see it, uh, you know, it starts to remove that veil that has continued to carry with, you know, throughout, like you said, since it was identified as gay cancer, I believe was the first term that they used back in 81. And so to be 40 years now, you know, 40 plus years into the epidemic, um, as you said, our community continues to suffer under the weight of just stigma. And so the main goal of the book was to show that when you come from a loving family, it doesn't necessarily necessarily negate that you'll go through stigma and trauma, but it does always give you a place to call home. And it always gives you a place to have this community. And it builds strong characters like myself to be able to go out into the world to reduce the stigma and to fight back against the stigma and to change the narrative. and. As you said, I think if we, like Amara was saying, if we can get back to the black community as the, really the root of, of our safety and the root of what we call home, no matter how you identify gender wise or sexuality, um, I think that is how we start to move past the epidemic because that's really where the healing has to start. It has to start at the places where we're most broken. And you know, it, it really is the fact that our intersections other us and you know we are already othered by white society and we are already othered by um you know anti-blackness and, and just all of the things in the world and anti-queerness and so we can't do that to ourselves mm -hmm. I, I, that's that's so well stated and i, I agree with you 100 percent amara in your work at ahf and and leading black what is what is what have been your experiences when you go into the community, right? Um, and in, in terms of black people around HIV and AIDS and stigma, and then also black, you know, black queerness. So it's been it's been really interesting, and I think it's been one of the um, unique aspects of HF is that you know we have a real commitment to not do things in the traditional way, as you both know. Um, and so it's really about innovation. You know, it's really about how do we create the opportunity to have conversations and how do we create the opportunity to have awareness, but that is not about judgment of any population within the black community, um, but really about how do we communicate with community? You know what I mean? And what's been interesting, and I've been a firm believer in this, you know, because transparently, I didn't come out of, you know, out of a public health space. Um, so I only joined AHF five years ago, but I had been in, I've been black for almost fifty years, and you know so. No, really, really. I, I, I never would have known. I know. I'll tell you a funny story later about for the one night that I was white, but every other time, <laughs> for the rest of the time in my life, I've been a black man. So, but um, but all jokes aside, what's been interesting is that I have, and from my perspective, felt like aid service organizations for most of this journey have only been having conversations around HIV and AIDS with the LGBTQ plus community. And if you go back a layer more, most of it really with the white LGBTQ plus community. So, you know, kind of to, to George's point, we've almost voided a whole population that now unfortunately is disproportionately impacted by the epidemic. But I, you know, I come from the space, Nathan, that nobody gets a pass. 
So I don't care what your gender identity is. You know, I don't care what your sexual orientation is. If you show up and you identify as black, then we need to have a conversation and engage as brothers and sisters, no matter, you know, what other aspects of your identity rep you represent. Um, but I think that's got to be the point of connecting and to recognize that we really have to stay in a place of commitment of being my brother and my sister's keeper, no matter if, you know, how your brother or sister may identify in other aspects of their identity. Um, and I think if we can start there first, and that's really the lens of the work that we've tried to do is say, this work is about talking to community and creating safe spaces that however you identify, that this is a safe space to come into community. And in, and in a lot of the work that we do, you know, we start with that. If this can't be, if you don't feel that this can be a safe space for you, then, you know, we don't ask you to leave right now because it's going to be a safe space for everybody to be present. And it's been interesting because even individuals that we, you know, maybe would have stigmatized and stereotyped and said they don't want to be a part of it. You know, they, you know, they too macho or they too this have really been ingrained in wanting to um, have a deeper understanding. Because at the end of the day, I, I, I think I firmly feel like at the end of the day, we all just want to be seen, we all just want to be recognized, and we all just want to be loved and valued. You know, my, 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 my best friend in my head, well, I have two best friends in my head, Oprah and Beyonce, but uh, uh, Oprah says, you know, we all just want to know that we matter, right? Yeah. Um, I have to say, for just I have to little take a personal privilege that how much I've learned in this process and how mm -hmm. much I've grown. There's something, George, that you say uh, that um, I never really processed before about uh, diminishing who I am, right, to make other people comfortable. Mm -hmm. But we've been, Amar and I had an offline conversation about this and it's not some, you know, we are of a, a bit of a different generation than you are. And so your generation is opening our eyes to different things that we just processed as that's just how it is, you know? And yeah. and you you did enough just to trailblaze by saying, this is who I am, right? Um, and you didn't really ask for much more. So if your family accepted you and the your friends accepted you, you didn't really push for much more. And your generation is pushing, 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 and I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've learned a great deal and I've grown a great deal um, from this. And I think that, and I hope that um, one of the things that people take away from this is that everybody's invited to the cookout. And the reason why everybody has to be invited to the cookout is because that is when we are the most powerful. Mm -hmm. Community is our superpower, right? That came up, that came up um, in a, a conversation Amar and I were having with, with someone else about this project. And I took it and ran and was like, that's a part of our campaign. You know, community is our superpower. But I truly believe that this is the truth. We saw what happened in the election, right? We saw what happened when you harness Black people and you bring us together and, and we really are collective, right? So why don't we do that for ourselves? Why don't we collectively heal ourselves? Why don't we collectively, you know, deal with economic empowerment? I could go on and on. But that's what I've gotten from this experience and from this film and from the book and from, you know, just our collaboration is that we really are powerful together and we need to be every we need everybody at the cookout. Talk about what, what you you expect and want people to take away from this, uh, George. Yeah, I guess what I want people to take away from this is a well, for those who. I guess haven't paid attention to the person to the left of them or the person to the right of them to now maybe start to pay attention a little bit more to the person to the left of them or the person to the right of them. I think everybody just assumes that everybody walks this earth as cis hetero people. And you know, that's the first assumption when somebody walks in a room, you already start to say, oh, this person is black, this person is a woman, and this person is, and you really don't know. And so I hope what people take away from it, which again, it starts at the title, you know, all boys aren't blue. Like, I mean, it's literally from the beginning before you even open up the book, it is a declaration to say like, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> I mean, as funny as that, as cliche as that is, but you really can't because, you know, 
Um, you, you may look at someone and see something and, and because of how we are conditioned, you already make up in your mind that this person is this thing. Um, and if you just take the moment to get to know the person, uh, you may in turn get to know yourself. And um, so, yeah, I hope that's the takeaway is that mm -hmm. people start to get to know people who they assume are a thing, but in turn, take time to process, am I actually this person or am I the person that society told me to be? Mm. You better preach, George. Exactly. I know. I I'm telling you, I tell you it's enlightening every time you open your mouth. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Amara, for, for Black and AHF, and then for you personally, because you obviously are invested in this personally. Take That's a dual question. What do you what do you want in terms of your role at Black and AHF? And then also, what does Amara want people to take away from this moment? So first of all, I, I want to say a, a testament to George. Um, he has, um, this book has helped me grow. And, you know, and this journey has helped me grow because I think part of it, answering your question, Nathan, is I think it, it gives us all the opportunity. Because sometimes my mother always says, when you point a finger, there's four pointing back at you. And I told her it's a lot because it's really three because the thumb's not pointing at you, but I got, you know, with <laughs> but, And but, you got in trouble for that. I did, I did. Um, but seriously, is that it's allowed an opportunity. And one of the things I would encourage people to do is to take a look in the mirror because sometimes it's so easy to say, well, I'm doing this work or we're doing this to heal or to address this challenge in other people and not knowing that sometimes it's also for you. So it's really been, so one is I, I just hope that people in the true spirit of love for self and love for community, will do the easy work of just looking in the mirror first and saying, what am I supposed to learn for me as I then bring that message, meaning the greater I, bring that message to community. So that, that's one thing, because I think we all, the first step of it is to look at, to recognize our own self, you know, and to recognize what is the intersectionality, what is the connection between us in, in this building community? So that's the piece. Then there's the business piece. Um, and the business piece is recognizing and valuing and honoring what George said. But if you have the wherewithal, we as Black folks have got to support Black folks. So go get this book. It's at Target. It's, you know, you can get it at Amazon. But go get this book because the experience that you've had through this virtual experience is just a small teaser of what I really think is the transformation of self through the journey, God bless you, through the journey of George being vulnerable and sharing his life. And we need to support that and uplift that in, in some tangible ways. Um, and the third thing is, is just really is um, to elevate us all to a greater commitment of really taking the journey of getting to know each person for who they are not who is comfortable for who we want them to be, not who is comfortable for who society said, but who are they? And what is a part of their identity is important to them and to embrace that and to love that and to be open to share your own levels of identity that are important to you and that that will truly build community. Amen. And we'll wrap up, um, but I, I will say that personally, I want people one one thing about the film, the creative part of it. Um, the vision for it was that we are works of art, right? And so I wanted us to be surrounded by beautiful works of art from African-American artists curated by an African-American art dealer and just really illuminate our skin tones and 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 really translate what uh, what we, because I, I think most people, when they, we heard, they heard a dramatic reading, they thought it was going to be one thing and then they got what we, what we just delivered. So I'm, I'm just very happy to, to be able to express the art artistry in that way with the text. Then I also learned a lot. Um, you know, I, I thank you again, George, for understanding non-binary, understanding gender um, identity a lot more than I have. You know, I'm, I'm 10 years older than you. I'm, I'm, you know, about to be 45. And so there's a lot of this that is new for me. And I have to applaud you for being also very gentle with me as I learned and as I had to correct myself. And and um, 
it has really been an education for me around gender identity and what non-binary means and gender expression and why that's so important that we respect that from people. When people say, this is who I am and -hmm. please address me as such, why that's important that we do that. So I learned that. And then the third thing is, I hope people have fun. I hope people enjoyed it because it's a fun film. Um, and, you know, the good news about it is it's not over. You've got some, For if anybody's been sleeping under a rock, can you wrap up and tell us what's next for the project and just, you know, some wrap up? Yeah. Um, and so I always like to preface because I, I do a lot of Zooms and just a lot of things now. So my pronouns changed in the midst of after the book came out. And so in the book, it is he, him. And we even had to put a disclaimer for the newer editions that come out. So in the book, it is he, him. I now go by they, them. And like I always tell everybody, this is for me personally, um, I identified as he, him for 34 years. And so I am still having to have grace with myself, with my own truth and my identity. So I extend that grace to others who are also still working through it with me. Um, so I just appreciate that every, that people are trying. That's my, that's all my goal is, is because it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me as much, but I know it bothers the 12 year old and the 15 year old and the 18 year old that is really, you know, coming up behind me. And so I have to, do the work to 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 break it all down uh so that they have the pathway to walk through but i'm gonna be good you know um but with the the book we're working on a tv show with uh being produced by gabrielle union and her production company as well as sony television uh we are currently or we're about to go into the pitch phase uh which is you know taking it out to see who may want to acquire the project um we're really excited about it it will focus on the college years uh, and it will, I think the beautiful thing about the story we're going to tell is it will, you know, tell some of the things that weren't in the book, uh, you know, heavily reflect a lot of the things that were in the book, but also give uh, the character of George the opportunity to potentially have conversations, wow. and make, make different choices uh, if I could have went back in time to, to do some things. So I think it'll be great because it'll show the, the totality of what our experience was, as well as what the experience could be. Uh, with with certain things from community uh, stepping up in a way to protect us. So yeah, that's great. Uh, Amara, what are your your wrap up thoughts? Wrapping what's next for Black AHF? What's what's going on? Well, we we want to just encourage everybody to stay engaged with the work that we're doing through Black. So of course you can go to blacc.net and you know connect with us and continue. There, there's a lots of great projects um, that are coming down the pipeline not just around HIV and AIDS, but just around uplifting community. Um, And, you know, trying to creatively think how the three of us get to work together again in some more stuff. So, you know, we got to get George now before before he gets to Hollywood. (laughs) (laughs) I know, because, you know, once we get get them, it's all over. It's going to be Prince Carlton and all of that. (laughs) <laughs> now, Nathan, I, I also, though, I want to throw the question to you because you've got some great things happening, too. So tell us about what's going on with Nathan Hale Williams and Hale. Well, first of all, I just want to say um, thank you to both of you for your partnership, for your vision, for your work, for your friendship. Um, Amara and I always I had already had a friendship. And George, I, I hope you count on me, count me as I count you as a new friend. I just adore you both. And I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. It's, it's been one of the highlights in my recent career. And so I wanna thank you both for that. I also wanna thank GLAAD uh, for giving us this after talk platform and just Sean Usher and Rich Ferrara over at GLAAD for just being a great partner to this whole endeavor and then giving us this platform. Uh, And of course, thank you to Black and AHF for continued support. Um, Well, I have another project with uh, AHF debuting later this month. Uh, It's a documentary on the homeless crisis called It Can't Be Done, Ending Homelessness in America that premieres at uh, the Pan-African Film Festival, which is the world's largest African-American film festival. Um, And uh, we're excited about that. So we got much work to do. Um, A a pilot I just finished based on my novel, Ladies Who Lunch and Love, uh, is being shopped around. And then I am writing 
um, to Amara's Delight, uh, a feature length film based on a film that AHF and Black uh, sponsored called 90 Days, dealing with HIV and AIDS in the Black heterosexual community. So uh, there's a lot going on and uh, you can catch me at uh, www.inhaleent.com. I would be remiss if I didn't take thank my wonderful business partner, Richard E. Pelzer II, also known as Uncle Richard, Lauren Hogan, who has been our partner in this the whole time. And uh, you can, and uh, I'll give everyone um, a chance to talk about your social media handles. Mine are Nathan H. Williams on Instagram, Twitter, and then uh, hit to you, George. Oh, mine are uh, at I am GM Johnson on Twitter and on Instagram and George Matthew Johnson on Facebook, because as I always say, there are still people who don't know that my first name is George. So I always have to put Matthew um, for the people still on Facebook. Great. <laughs> uh, Black is B-L-A-C-C underscore A-H-F on Instagram and then B-L-A-C-C dot A-H-F um, on Facebook or the Black Leadership AIDS Crisis Coalition. Um, and you can Google that on Facebook and, and say there. And Nathan, I would also be remiss. I want to give just a, a special shout out and appreciation to our CEO, Michael Weinstein, who really is so supportive of the creative projects that have been able to come out of Black and HF. And also um, one of our vice presidents, Anita Castile, um, both are who you know are Nathan's secondary to me biggest fan in terms of his creative work and really have been so inspired and enlightened by the work that, that George is doing. And um, I, I thank you both. George, thank you again for trusting Black and HF to do this project with your work. And Nathan, thank you for being open to, in a crazy time in your life, to pause and bring your creative genius to bring this to life. Um, and to all of the community partners that you both really helped to bring together to be a part of this project, including GLAD and so many others. Um, this really could not be done without the family coming together. So we thank you. Amen. Well, on, without, on that note, we are going to sign off. Now, if your family and friends did not catch it, the replay will be available throughout the month of February. Go to black, B-L-A-C-C dot net for all the replaying information or inhale mega V. So youtube.com slash inhale mega V-E-E -E and catch a replay of the film. Thank you all so much. Have a good night. Community is our superpower because stigma got it. <laughs> Bye y'all.